Okay, so you just picked up your new favorite best VTT virtual tabletop, but now you need some maps. Where are you going to get them? Well, you could use the built-in VTT drawing tools and make out some blobby, you know, kind of color maps here and there, uh, which work okay. Uh, you can photocopy from books or possibly scan from uh, PDFs, but now you have to align the grid to the VTT's grid, which doesn't always work right. You can pick up some maps free online on Reddit or Discord, but they may not necessarily match exactly what you're going for. You can also pick up a free copy of Krita, Fireplace, Inkscape, or GIMP, or uh, possibly even Adobe, but I hear they've been having some problems lately. And, you know, learn to draw. And, of course, there would be some benefits to doing that as well. But it, it, that's going to take a lot of time, and it's probably going to be more time than you need before your first session on your VTT. But if we draw ourselves a little Venn diagram where you combine ease of use, customization, and quality, in the dead center there is a spot where you will find a program that I've been using for over a year now. Now previously I've used Illwinter's floor plan generator, which is pretty good, but lately I have been using Dungeon Draft, and I've been very pleased with it, so I've decided to post a review here, or on my channel. And I don't normally do demos, but at the end of this video we are going to make this map at the end of the video, which is inspired by an RPG encounter. This is something you're going to have to do, because if you want to get the most out of your VTT, you're going to need to make at least 50 maps in Dungeon Draft. So, quick description. Dungeon Draft is made by Megasplute, which also makes the, uh, he also makes the Wonder Draft for larger scale maps. It's available for 64-bit just about everything, Windows, Mac, uh, Linux. The system requirements are modest, but depending on the level of detail you're going for, uh, you, you may hear the CPU fan of your computer spool up while you're working on things. Price tag is $20 US dollars and is available through Humble. Now, what kind of tools do you get with Dungeon Draft? Well, popping in here, you can see at the very top here, we have our design, where we have our, our building tools. You can use these to make, you know, entire enclosed buildings. You can add portals, windows, and uh, doors, things like that. Uh, you, you also got a wall tool if you just want some walls with no building to make ruins and things like that. You also got a, a pattern shape tool if you want to make a floor with no no walls. I mean, like a patio, like not stuff like a patio, like a boardwalk things like that. Uh, you've also got a roof tool, which is great for overhead areas, which is good because if you use Foundry VTT, you know that you know it, it operates in layers. There's a, a primary layer, a secondary layer, and then the fog layer as well. Under terrain, we can make our different terrains. Um, it has comes with quite a few. A water brush, you can make all kinds of different colors of liquid. A material brush, which has some more outlandish things in here. You, you can, there's even like gold in here. There's lava in here. And also a path tool, which you can use to make paths of rope or chain, fence lines, stairs, all kinds of things. Uh, and under objects, you have individual things that let you um, add details to your scene. Uh, you know, beds, uh, desks, traps, suits of armor, uh, weapons racks, all, all kinds of things. Pieces for bridges, pieces for boats. You know, it's, it's actually, it's whatever you're looking for, you're going to find it in here. All right, so effects, this one is the one that's going to help you put a lot of life into your maps. You got the whole overall environment light. Uh, you've also got light tools where you can put out individual lights into your scene. So for settings, under settings here, you'll find the, the overall map settings, uh, the opportunity to trace an image, but also the level settings where you can create not just the ground level, but a treetop level, a fog level, things like that. And under text, of course, you can add text. It's text. What else can I say? And the last one, well, the second last one is the prefab, where you, if you have an arrangement that you really like, like a room or a collection of objects, you can use the prefab to select it all and recreate it into other, other areas, recreate it in other maps that you make later. And the selection tool to select things, but this is actually a source of some criticism that I'll get into a little bit later. So what's to like about Dungeon Draft? Well, off the bat, I love the price tag, $20. This is what you would pay for two double-sided dry erase maps, a small collection of markers, and an eraser. So for a, a virtual version of something that you do normally in person, this is a really good price tag. Also, doing this is faster than learning to draw and collect assets, but there, there are technically benefits to doing that as well that could help you in other parts of your life. It does offer art-style layers and levels, and this is great for VTT systems that support multiple floors or a fog layer like Foundry VTT, where you have like the ground floor, you have an upper level, but you also have a fog layer to kind of uh, facilitate exploration. 
Um, and when you have a drawing on one layer's components, you don't have to worry about it interfering with another layer when you switch them over. You have a great snap grid for quick squares and circular buildings, and it also lets you adjust the size of a building easily, and it also lets you line up things on different layers very easily as well. And you can also turn it off for more exact placement, especially of objects. Uh, it, it offers really good support for natural curves for things like walls, terrain features, shorelines, caves, trails, things like that. And speaking of caves, you can gouge out entire sections of terrain. It has a specific cave tool, and this helps you hide underground elements from players uh, when they first start exploring a map. As well as a fairly active tutorial community on YouTube, Discord, and Reddit. And even on Reddit, you can go and they'll actually remake book maps at better resolutions for existing modules. And the maps look fantastic with a little work. The first time I ever tried this in my own games, my players thought that I'd grabbed a, a map from online, but in fact I'd spent a little time making it. Okay, now Dungeon Draft is not perfect. Uh, there, there are going to be a couple of cons, and the first one I'm going to point out is the large number and variations in the deletion process. Now, inevitably you're going to make a mistake or want to change something, and there's a couple of different ways depending on the tool you use. Some of them have you select and delete points, some of them have you right click, some of them have you out click, some of them have you switch to the selector tool. And this actually varies from tool to tool and makes things a little, uh, and, and until you're used to that, it actually takes a little bit of uh, work. But the good news is Control Z for undo still works. You're gonna have to get used to the difference between a level and a layer. Layers are subcomponents of levels and only certain tools work on certain layers. Uh, for example, um, you, generally there's four user layers, which are mostly for objects and buildings and things like that. But other tools like water, they mostly only work on other sections. And levels are different maps that overlap together. Your, your rooftops, your treetops, things like that. Things that are going to show up on your fog layer, things you want overhead above the players as they're exploring the map. And levels and layers, it wouldn't be so bad, but they operate in different directions. So if you have your levels, your levels go from the bottom up. The, the bottom one is the bottommost map, the top is the topmost. However, when it comes to layers, not levels, the, the bottommost part is the above rooftop level, and the lowest part is the terrain level and below ground level. So it kind of works in reverse. Now there are no built-in options for hexagon grids, which is bad if you're more uh, war game or battle tech oriented. Um, however, it is possible to print an ungridded map and then add grids through other software um, like Inkscape or something like that. And speaking of Battletech, there's no included sci-fi assets. Now, packs are available on Patreon or cartographyassets.com. Uh, I've had some trouble with cartography assets. I haven't gotten their wishlist system to work yet. And cost varies a lot for the follow-on distribution. So if you're going to run your game online or something like that, you have to make sure you're buying the right pack. And if you don't think that kind of problem is going to come up, there's a reason the uh, some of the character intros are blurred out in the early episodes of uh, Critical Role. All right, so some recommendations for your maps. Number one, place objects to create hints for your players, things that actually elicit them to ask for things. So if you if you have the, the most common one, of course, is a bloody streak along the ground to indicate that a body has been dragged somewhere. The players will ask, hey, where does this go? You can tell them, hey, you can tell your players, hey, oh, you, you're welcome to check that out. That's a part of the map. Number two, use lights to breathe life into an environment and adjust light for quick morning, day, evening, night maps. Uh, it's actually one of the most useful features. Try to move away from default shadows early, and I, I even go so far as to reserve user-defined layer 1 just for my shadows, and then user-defined layer 4 for overhead shadows. Now if you're going to print out to a VTT, turn the grid off when you export, uh, because your VTT will usually offer its own grid options. Export the base level as a JPEG because this will preserve uh, memory and reduce the amount of bandwidth that you need to use in order to get your map to the players. But for second levels and above, switch to PNG to preserve transparency. Now if you're actually going to print out your maps, um, use PNG for lossless quality and select your grid of choice. Now with all of that done, let's make a map together! Now, it doesn't matter what paint program you use, and you don't even necessarily have to do this, but what I like to do sometimes is I like to kind of compose my picture to, to give me an idea of what dimensions I'm going to need when I move over to Dungeon Draft, and I try to compose a little story around the map as well. So, uh, this is going to be flowing from, set players are going to go from south to north here, uh, they're going to start down here on land, there's going to be a bridge crossing a big river, over here there's going to be a mill on the, on the right side, sorry, yep, on the right side. 
And there's also going to be a mountain on the right side, and on the left side it's going to be mostly trees to provide some shade and a little life to the scene. But secretly, at the south end of here, there's going to be a two soldiers operating a tollway. These two soldiers are secretly bandits. And what they're doing is, they, they don't charge a lot to cross, but what they do is they assess how wealthy you are uh, when you try to go across. So if you're poor, they kind of just let you go. If you're dressed wealthy, and if you look wealthy, if you look well-to-do, but you don't seem like you have a lot of coins on you, what they do is they signal their buddies who are hiding underneath the bridge to pop out and grab you and kidnap you. They take you into the mill. And there's actually a secret entrance inside of the mountain, which was previously used for storage or something like that, where they hold their hostages. And if you're obviously holding lots of coins and you're wealthy, they signal their buddies, their buddies jump out, they ambush you, they, they kill you, and then they drag your body into the water. And we're going to leave things on our map as clues to this, this plan by these bandits to, to indicate to our players exactly what is going on. I have some other assets downloaded. I've disabled all of these, so I'm only using the default assets, which is exactly what you will have if you buy Dungeon Draft. So let's start a new, and this is a fairly vertical map. And in general, I find that you don't need as much map as you think you do. So what we're gonna do is we're gonna go with a height of 25 tiles. No, we're gonna go with a width of 25 tiles. And we're gonna go with a height, let's say 40 tiles. And we're not gonna use the map wizard. Uh, we're gonna, yeah, we are gonna turn off wall shadow and object shadow because we're gonna. I'm, I'm doing the works here. I'm gonna. I'm, not, I'm gonna do everything manually so that you can see how I'm doing. So let's hit OK. All right, and this is how Dungeon Draft starts us off with a pile of dirt. So I like to start with some terrain and the terrain brush and the baseline, of course, is dirt. But I think instead of dirt. This is a nice grassy area, you know, a pleasant, uh, pleasant meadow. Now our final version, because we're going to mess with lighting, is not going to be quite this bright, but it, it's, this is kind of what we're going with right now. Okay, so comparing that to our map, we need a river to the south. So we come over here to our water brush, and these default colors are pretty good for rivers. I may go a touch bluer though. Let's, let's go a touch bluer. There we go. And move the slider closer to the blue. There we go. That's nice. Okay, good blend distance. We're gonna probably gonna need a big brush. And let's draw ourselves a river. Now, I kind of want a slightly serpentine river over here because uh, the mill, which is gonna be over here on the on the right side, is gonna overlap with the river. And over here, we're going to have um, a landing area or sandbar, which has normally got water, but we will say we've had a bit of a drought lately, and the drought has actually caused um, part of the river on the north end to be exposed. And don't make your river super uniform. You know, you want to add a little blob here and there, a little inlet here and there. Um, give it, give it some, give it some character. The perfection, as they say, is in the imperfection. Okay. Let's go back to our terrain. And so on top of that, we're not going for gravel right away. We want maybe swampy, maybe sandy. We're gonna go with sand. All right, now we don't need that bit. We can use the mouse wheel to kind of reduce this. And now you do have to, depending on your intensity and the brush size, you do, we're gonna raise the intensity because we do want a lot of sand here. This is gonna be a pretty substantial sandbar. There we go. Alright, that looks good. Alright, going back to our gravel, let's scale our brush down. We only want a little bit of gravel to kind of define the, uh, just the edge of the... And one of the neat things about Dungeon Draft is it'll actually blend the gravel into, into the water. Because if I scroll down here, you can see the chunks of the gravel in the water. Which is pretty nice. All right, but we also need a road. What is a good, we can do dirt, we can do sand, we can do swamp, we can do rocky. Um, I'm gonna do dirt. Now we want a fairly big brush size for this because we got the road to the south and we want the road going north and we're probably gonna make this a little bit bigger before we're done here. Let's expand that out a little bit. Blue, 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 blue. There we go. That's a proper sized multi lane road. Let's get this as close to the water's edge as we can without going over. All right. 
Uh, do we want any more water feet? Now, there's a material that we also want too. Uh, we want grass tile. Now, what this does is it will create the, like these little patches here and there. Uh, around here to, to kind of indicate the kind of it's, it's a good way to indicate you know where the wilds start and and where the road ends where where the road is no longer groomed i should say you might say um i don't see us using any ice um but i do want to use some rock tile and there's a reason for that hold down the center mouse so let's put some rock up here this is used to indicate where the mountain range starts Rock, 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 rock. Very nice. And there we go. Now you can, if you prefer, well, let's see. We do have a cobblestone tile. Let's test that. Do we like cobblestone here? No, that's a little too urban. This is a very rural area. Okay, we're pretty happy with it. Let's work on the mill. So we need a building. Let's grab our building, and we have to select a wall, and should probably be wood here. Wood zero three. Wood slat, I'd say. And we'll make this a little bit brighter because this is a, a high moisture area. And for our floor, uh, let's see, regular smart wood would work just fine. I, let's see, down here we got wood interlaced. Wood, dam wood damaged, there's an idea for you. And the color for that, we want to make that fairly dark, I'd say. Okay, now for the approximate area of our building. Do, do, do. Let's see, that. So a mi an actual mill would overlap with the water, I'd say. There we go. And now we need some portal features. A regular old door, that's good. Blip, right there. And let's throw in like a couple of shuttered windows. One there, one there, and one in the front. Very nice. Okay, now we need another door here to indicate. Well, let's, we're not, we're not gonna paint this. Now I would put a, since we have that secret area where uh, people are being held, uh, I'm not gonna put a, window there or door there that because that's going to be a secret wall it's going to be hidden in fact let's put some furniture in front of that but we're doing furniture later spare walls like if i wanted some ruins i could just throw a wall somewhere the cave brush here we go all right style i want to match that up and you can see that this tool takes a bite out of the cave so we're going to have an open area inside of here which is where our hostages are being held. We get a little bit bigger. Very nice. Now you, you kind of want a minimum thickness here because you don't want the players to be able to see into the mountainside. And I'm gonna need a big piece of furniture, but you can see here where, uh, yeah, this is the stonework. Don't no, we'll worry about that later. Okay. So continuing on, we're kind of at the point now where we need to put, start putting in the object details. So let's go to our objects here, objects tool on the right side. We've got all kinds of tabs here. Let's see, we'll look at a couple of things. Barrel, it makes sense that uh, you know a mill would have a couple of barrels, that makes sense. And we hold down the Alt key to increase the size and then the mouse wheel to rotate it. Uh, so the, the, this is probably a granary, so they have a couple of barrels of grain or bags of grain. A bed, no, no beds, no blacksmith stuff. They might have some things outside though. Blood stains here. Actually, before we go this far, let's be smart. And we're going to get a bridge. Boom, there we are. Now this is gonna be a two segment bridge and tell you what, let's make this a stone bridge. Rotate, hold down the Alt key to resize. Uh, let's see, let's turn shadow off. We're gonna do manual shadows. Mm, let's see, bridge 06, yeah, this is much, much better looking. Oh, and most importantly though, let's switch ourselves over to user layer two because we're gonna use user layer one for our shadows. I like this. But before I go this far, I want to have 
I want a column base in the center to make it look like, you know, oh, we got the bridge pieces here too, that's handy. Kind of the stone area. Actually, this, this works well as part of our base. All right. Nice, okay. So we'll put this about four wide. And make it a little bit thinner here, there we go. So the columns at the bottom, they've, they've seen some better days. Oh, we needed some furniture. Storage, that's a good choice. Here we go. Ah, a wardrobe, that's perfect. Let's spin that around. And we need, since, this, since you see how this is popping into place, I need to make sure I turn snap off for this particular feature because I need it to be very exact. Positioning, there we go. And now I can turn snap back on for some other features. A boat, like a little long boat over here that actually might be kind of useful to create the appearance that this is a area seeing a t touch of commerce maybe oh don't forget a, like a like an oar because of course someone's got to paddle the boat now a popular option is to have a one of these smashed carts um as, a, as an indicator to the adventurers that something is going on we're not going to be that obvious though okay i can't find a specific water wheel but under gears we do have this let's make that a little bit bigger there we go, it actually works really well. Uh, but we need to, let's see, a stone a structure inside to kind of play the role of our, uh, this is technically an altar, but that's not a bad stand-in for a, a grindstone. Yeah, we'll use that as a stand-in for our grindstone. There we go. All right, our mill kind of looks like a mill. Let's see, but our water does not look very interesting. So we're gonna add a couple of things. One is, just a couple of eddies here. And uh, we wanna make sure those change the color to a nice pleasant blue here. There we go. Let's make it a little splashier than that. Come on, you can get splashier. There we go, that's better. Yeah, and this will help indicate to the players which direction the water is going. Because we have these little marks and splashes coming off the back end of the, uh, the structure here. And we could even take it a step further and add this coming off of the water wheel. That works really well. Not bad, not bad. It's okay. We need some structure down here to stretch our rope across so that the, uh, the players can be obstructed. So, pillar stone. That's pretty good. That would work just fine. So we'll add that there, and we'll do it to the same the other side, because bridges, you know, they're, they're built fairly uniformly. And we can even add a pair in the center to create the impression that, yes, the uh, it is being held up by the centerpiece here. For our lighting, ah, a nice little wall sconce for a touch of, touch of lighting inside of the cave. And let's turn our snap off so that we can precisely place this. Bloop, right there. And I like to just go through these one at a time just to see if there anything jumps out at me. Floating, that's always a fun one because we can take this splashy patch here and place it underneath our water wheel to kind of give it a little more turbulence. Now, since this is the base layer, we're only going to place some tree stumps, not whole trees. Uh, let's go relatively small stumps here. Let's turn our snap back on. That makes it easy to line things up later. And these can be used to create shade for our passing adventurers. Very nice. Maybe a little entry carpet. Give it a nice brown because, of course, they've, uh, they've wiped their feet on it a great many times. Maybe just a small touch of blood. Make sure it's a nice pink color. And we'll put this eh, not too close to the edge of the bridge, but just a little bit to indicate some nefarious activity. Garden planters, eh, they might have a herb garden, who knows? A little flower bed. Very homey, very homey. Hey, why not a log? And I like this log because it's got little, uh, little wave indicators around it, so that's kind of fun.
I'm not going to be obvious and put like bodies. <laughs> let's see. All right, let's go back to our trees. Maybe a touch of fallen branches here and there. Nothing too big, though. Because these trees are not meant to be the... Uh, but who knows? Players might need some driftwood for some reason. Nice. Okay. That's not too boring. Rocks. It doesn't hurt to have a couple of rocks here and there. Why not? Now we're going to go on to paths. There we go. They're part of our material brushes. There's the path tool. And here are some of the paths that we can create. Uh, off the bat, like a wagon trail. Um, this is... This is to kind of indicate, you know, wagon trails. And we, we finish up with a right click at the top. And they, they should cross each other a little bit. That's fine. This wagoneer was a little tipsy. <laughs> And we need the rope that is used to uh, prevent the players passing here to enable. Now we need to put this on layer three because remember this bridge is on layer two. There we go, just a nice rope. Now another thing we may want to consider. Now we'll want this to be a bit thinner. Let's dial that back to about 0.29. Again, we want to put it on layer one. It's going to be right on the ground. Turn off edit points. Little, little blood smear to give some indication to our players. Okay. That's a pretty good ground level going back to my Krita image. Looks pretty good. Going back to our building tool and now we're gonna go to our pattern shape tool. We're gonna give a little life here to our, uh, to our area. We're going to say the sun is coming from, we'll say this is evening, sun is coming from the west. Slightly to the south, it's summertime. So, Let's create some manual shadows, and then we'll put this on your laser user layer one, which we reserved just for um, things that we make. All right, so that's not all right. So we need to give it some color. Derp. <laughs> Go all the way to black, and then turn your alpha about halfway down. Alpha is basically the transparency. All right, let's try this again. Let's try this again. So initial arch and it comes down into here. Boom. To take a look at that. That's a nice quality shadow. And let's add a section of shadow over here, which is coming off of the building. Happy little shadows. <laughs> and our trees need some shadows too. All right, let's talk about some ambient lighting. So for the environment, you never want to go max, maybe even like just a touch of yellow. Natural light is actually blue. It's a really strong blue, but I'll say it's like the start of evening, just starting to creep into cyan a little bit. There we go. That's pretty nice. That's pretty nice. But we also need some interior lights, some small interior lights. In this case, this one's coming from the wall sconce, and this is, we'll say it's coming from an unknown source. There we are. But it does illuminate the interior of this. And now, let's go to our layers, <laughs> our level settings, I should say. So this is the ground level. We'll leave it that name. Let's add a new level is the treetop. Hit accept, and let's hit up compare levels, and this will give us like a, a slightly darkened version of the way things look from the ground. 20% uh, opacity is good. 820, 80 current level, 80%. Let's, and let's yeah, let's stay at 80% on the top level here. Okay, so we need a top for this mountain range. We need trees for our trees, and we need a roof for this structure over here. Let us start with our mountain range here. Let's see. No, we don't want the cobblestone tile. We don't want, there we go. The stone tile. Nice. 
So now you can see that's going to partly cover. We actually want that. We want that to partly cover this area here. Let's see, we do have snap turned on. There we go. We can also copy and paste that section too. Let's trim the fat off of that just a little bit. Okay, and now we also need a roof. So we go to our roof tool and we'll go with, let's see, plank mossy. Uh, you know what, it's a mill. Let's go with mossy, that works. Sun direction, let's see here. Blip, 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 blip. Ding. All right, so that's not good because it's got the wrong sun direction. So we want to flip the sun direction around. That's better. That is the correct sun direction there. All right, let's cap off our trees now. So let's go to objects, object tool, tree. And since we can see the stumps, we know where to place the trees. Uh, let's see, a nice... The, yeah, the, the default assets have some pretty big trees available. Let's see. Like, if you want a really complex one, there's that. There we go. Some nice medium trees that we can... And we want these to overlap with the... Uh, well, actually, let me mention, too, that if you're going to create a forest, you want to start with the smaller trees first. So let's make a couple of these the small trees. And then we're gonna do the big trees because remember the big trees, and remember to rotate these a little bit so that they don't look too much like the default. And so it doesn't look like you're constantly copying and pasting. We're gonna do a mega tree down here. Yeah, there we go. Actually, we'll make this a, no, it's not gonna fit in with its buddies. And we'll stick with a regular tree here. There we go. And that overlaps with that. Okay. So actually, here's an idea. Since we can see the trees, let's use that as the basis for our shadow. Black. Okay, except since our trees are roughly spherical, do our groupings of trees as a single oval. That way it's a little stays a little neater. And we want to be just to the upper right. Because remember that's where our shadows are being cast. A little too big. Let's erase the last one and do these as a single big shadow. There we go. Okay, that's better. And there is our adventure. And we can hit, let's go up to the treetop level, get a comparison. Let's apply a slightly stronger sunlight to these treetops. There we go. Environment, ambient light, much stronger. And we'll go back to the ground level and we'll set the ambient light a little bit darker. So the players know that they are in the shade. Now we're going to export this. Let's hit export. Um, let's see. Well, before we do, number one, because we're going to put this into a VTT, we're going to turn off grid. Let's make sure we're on the ground level. Now let's hit export. JPEG, because this is the base layer, there's no transparency here. Um, we're not going to do an overlay level because we're going to do a fog level instead. No camera filter. I mean, there's some fun. Um, 50 pixels per inch, 1250 by 2000, so that's good. All right, so let's hit export. And, and we'll call this bandit ground level. And it displays where I put it. Now, we're going to do the treetop level. Grid is off, lighting is on, brightness, camera filter, grid presets, custom. Okay, now one other thing, the overlay level is actually really good if you've got a scene with like catwalks or um, things like that. Because you can apply 
like it says here, opacity to that. And so if you have a map, you can have it so that the players are underneath or over the overlay level. All right, but let's export. It's also handy for other things too, but let's hit export here. Oh, one th important thing, PNG, because PNG supports transparency. So let's hit export here. Bandit uh, treetop level. Okay, now we'll send those into our VTT and see how they work. Okay, so I got Forge fired up here. Let's create a scene. We'll call this. We're not, well, we don't want to use a little bit of meta, and uh, so let's call this um, Toll Bridge. So, background image. Okay, so we go in here to our maps, which is where I like to store mine. Band at ground level. There we go. Select file. Bring that up. And let's let's see here. The grid. I like a 50. Let's see, width was 1250, height was 2000. Um, padding percentage, we'll leave it at 10. Grid color, let's see, it was green, so let's use a dark green as our grid color. Lighting, token vision turned on, fog exploration turned on. For our fog of war image, we're going to use bandit treetop level. There we go. Fog of War Explored Color now in here. Yeah, we'll leave that at black. We don't have the option for transparency, unfortunately. Now this does create a slight meta with the uh, with the game, unfortunately. It's the underlying dimensions, that's fine. That's exactly what I did. There we go. Toll bridge. View scene. Okay. Now we don't see what the player sees, so let's create. So here's our test character, and our test character, let's drag them into the game here. Let's hit the mechanics, vision, vision enabled, vision range. It defaults to five feet per square, so we're gonna make this 30. That's a bit too far. Okay, let's not make that 30. Let's make that 25. All right, now before we bring the actor in, actually, let's set up our walls. So there's our wall control tool. Let's start with our firm walls and let us make sure that snap to grid is turned on because we used a grid when we uh, created this. So Bring in our actor. Vision is enabled. We're going to give him a vision range of about 15 instead. There we go. So while we are clicked on our actor, we get to see what they see as they move around. So as you can see, as they move towards the uh, the mill. Oh, one more thing I should add, of course, which is a regular door. There we go, let's go back to our actor. Okay, actor's moving around. Now, before the scene begins, we should have our player roll a perception check. And this will indicate if they see anything funny or if they hear rustling underneath the bridge that indicates something fishy is going on. And we wanna do that before the, the scene begins because that way, um, if, if you wait until the player is like halfway across the bridge and you have them roll a uh, perception check or the equivalent of, of other systems, they're, they're instantly going to know something is happening right here. So what we do is we have them pre-roll um, their perception check. And let me reset Fog of War again, just for fun. And that way, if they pass, they will know that something has happened somewhere. So they have their exchange with the two bridge guards, and if they're very, if they're very flippant with their money, showing you know, showing off their heavy bags of coins and things like that, the guards, of course, will signal the uh, the bandits to attack. 
but instead the, the players proceed forward and per perhaps they see this blood stain. They get kind of curious about the blood stain, and and heading up here, circ circling around, you know, they, they activate that uh, that check that they made earlier and indicates, aha, there's some bandits there. We get into a fight. A big battle ensues, and maybe they capture one of these bandits. Maybe they don't. But anyway, the, the players realize, well, something is going on in this area. Something involving either the boat or maybe the uh, the wheelhouse over here. So the players go over and they check the wheelhouse and they pop open the door and they move inside and say, oh, look, this area here, I don't know what's going on. We have them roll perhaps an additional perception check before they go in. And they, they run their search or perhaps a search check and they realize, hey, wait, there's perhaps there is a, uh, they, they realize there's a secret door and, you know, we can put some scratch marks here. We probably should have put some scratch marks here to indicate that this opens. Pop the secret door open and they go inside and, and there's... A, a wealthy individual with their family and, and they're like oh no well okay, good congratulations we rescued you now of course this creates an interesting conundrum for the players because uh, if they ask for money that makes them no different from the bandits because you know the bandits were going to ransom the family off anyway but the family says oh we own a very opulent inn we would happy to put you up for a couple of days if you would be so kind as to rescue us blah 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 and perhaps this opens up other opportunities for the players like maybe the city they're going to is hard to enter if you're not in the company of someone else someone who already has a special pass you know perhaps they can pass the players off as uh you know part of their entourage that sort of things but as we walk along, you know, we see it erases the uh, other things here, and uh, yeah, crazy a, a small encounter adventure with uh, with the map system. Anyway, that's all I've got. Uh, I will have a video on running the Force and Destiny system in a couple of weeks, and until then, happy gaming.